General Electric once held the largest market cap on the New York Stock Exchange, drifted from the industrial engineering to financial engineering, and came to pleasing shareholders at all costs is a story that must be discussed in all corporate boardrooms and management schools. GE's corporate leadership traded short-term profits for long-term pains, skimped on research and development, but lavished capital on its financial division, all with the blessing of toothless board of directors made up of who's who of corporate America. To find out more about this, we will be talking with eminent journalist and author William D. Cohen, Power Failure, the Rise and Fall of an American Icon. William D. Cohen is a former senior Wall Street investment banker for 17 years at Lazard Frere, Merrill Lynch, and J.P. Morgan Chase. is the New York Times bestselling author of three nonfiction books. He is a graduate of Phillips Academy, Duke University, Columbia University School of Journalism, and the Columbia University Graduate School of Business. Welcome to Rudera. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And uh, give us a little bit historical perspective of why GE is so important. And may, of course, most people know about Edison and GE's association, but you brought up a very important connection that most people don't know about Charles Coffin in the book. Yeah, like uh, many corporations uh, in their origin stories, uh, there's some uh, myth making involved in GE's origin story. They uh, like people to think, uh, and probably rightly so, that Thomas Edison was the founder of GE. It didn't take uh, much uh, digging to realize that that actually is only partially true and not particularly true at that. He was the founder of something called Edison General Electric, which later merged with another company uh, that Charles Coffin was uh, owned and was running to form uh, General Electric in 1892. But even at the time of that uh, merger, uh, Thomas Edison had basically checked out of Edison General Electric. He was no longer the CEO uh, of the company. Uh, he was against the merger. He uh, fought against it at least once before successfully. Uh, but Henry Villard, who was the CEO of the company and a you know shareholder, a uh, venture capitalist, uh, and J.P. Morgan, the man who uh, controlled the company, uh, wanted to do the merger, and they wanted Charles Coffin to uh, run the combined company. Uh, his uh, company, that was a competitor of Edison's company. Uh, was actually uh, much more profitable and run better than Edison's company. So they, uh, over Edison's uh, objections, strenuous objections, they uh, merged the two companies together, uh, and Edison left soon thereafter and you know, moved to New Jersey or something to develop like a, a limestone mine or something like that. And Coffin became the first CEO of GE. And I think you said in the book that after a few years or within a few short years, Edison sold all of his stake, about one and a half million dollars. Yes, I don't even think it would, took that long. I think uh, relatively soon after the merger, uh, he sold uh, his stake in the company. Uh, and in, in 1893, the next year, in fact, uh, there was a major financial crisis in the, in this country and uh, uh, GE almost went down the tubes back then, a year later, and uh, it was only because uh, they were able to buy their debt back at a discount with the blessing of J.P. Morgan, the man, uh, that they avoided going out of business in 1893 and then essentially uh, decided uh, thereafter that, uh, ironically, that less debt was better. And that was um, the way things uh, went at GE. Really, uh, you know, minimal debt, AAA re credit rating up and through uh, Jack Welch's uh, tenure, uh, which was, of course, uh, uh, much later. The historical arc between the Panic of 1893 and the subprime crisis of 2008 and nine is a fascinating two endpoints that you brought up in the book. Uh, if I recollect from the book, uh, almost G had $1.3 million in the bank at that time in 1893, or pan Panic of 1893, and had $10 million in debt. 
and of course we'll we'll talk more of it as as what happened during the subprime crisis but over the years GE had a strong culture strong strategic focus on industrial products and became a very successful as someone who can conceive and develop and create innovative products engineer engineering products a absolutely true uh, GE was one of the great uh technology technology companies of the 20th century you know everything from uh perfecting the jet engine to air conditioning to radio uh technology to dishwashers washing machines things that we you know take for granted uh, every day x-ray machines Heart, uh, mri yes. machines Heart, light yeah, bulbs, yeah. Park, yeah exactly it was uh, you know an incredible a uh, technology leader and um, you know to some extent you know it continued that way and 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 even to today uh i think in fairness uh you know the the problem was that it also became a very large uh financial institution leveraging uh, GE's AAA credit rating arbitraging GE's AAA credit rating to get into financial services in a big way mm -hmm. You brought up two very kind of notable CEOs that C, uh, GE had before Jack Welch and others. Uh, was uh, One was Cordier, uh, I believe Charles Cordier, and the other gentleman was uh, Reggie Jones. Can you explain a little bit what were the ethics and the uh, management styles during that time that they both had? And, and then we'll obviously move into the uh, Jack Welch era. Well, I mean, I think, you know, G GE uh, stood largely not without some uh major league slips here and there for sort of the rectitude of uh the american uh big company uh, and you know the, these guys uh these ceos of ge uh were highly respected uh to be on the ge board was like the uh, height of the success in uh, corporate america uh, they, uh, the GE uh, executives, uh, were, were among the founders of the Business Roundtable, you know, sort of the Washington corporate lobbying group, and were often its leaders. Uh, they often uh, uh, met with the presidents of the United States. You know, Reg Jones was a confidant of Jimmy Carter and would go to the White House uh, pretty regularly. So, I mean, again, there were scandals price fixing scandals that occurred but you know and not to minimize those and uh, g was a very powerful company and uh, you know would get itself into trouble occasionally uh but it really uh at one time stood for you know all that was uh, supposedly uh, right about uh, american uh, enterprise and american corporations and then uh, jack belch ended up with uh, GE and uh, ran GE Plastics. And there were some fascinating stories about GE Plastics that you have, especially with Norrell, the product Plastic Norrell. You brought up uh, how Jack Bell's personality that really brought it all together, even though it was not really their team that invented it. It was somebody else who left GE and, and, and had invented right. it, but uh, they finally discovered it. But, uh, but I think uh, there was this aggressive management style that uh, wherever it could took the uh, took the credit wherever they can and and but they managed to you know obviously he did very well with GE Plastics, but uh, w was there a management style that was that was evident at that time that uh, or how did he end up being in the prominent circles or someone who would be considered as a leadership position candidate? When Jack joined G Plastics it was uh really in its in its infancy and he he was uh an incredible salesman uh he he did have uh you know a, a chemistry uh background he got his PhD in chemical engineering or something and so he did uh from the University of Illinois I mean he did have uh an understanding of the chemistry of the product uh but he was uh uh, much more of an incre incredible salesman um, and uh, really commercialized, um, you know, these products that uh, GE uh, 
uh, and he would go out and uh, you know convince the car manufacturers to uh, uh, use uh, these GE plastics in the manufacture of their cars, uh, as opposed to you know uh, steel or or aluminum, uh, and uh, you know it became a force uh, to be reckoned with uh, at GE and impressed you know one boss after another uh, who uh, felt that Jack was. Uh, a bit aggressive, uh, no prisoners kind of guy, but somebody who uh, uh, showed real potential and, you know, they should sort of keep their eye on him. And, uh, you know, so he was incredibly successful at uh, GE Plastics, uh, did not uh, uh, want to, you know, he, he was he kept being urged to go to headquarters, at GE's headquarters, which was on Lexington Avenue in New York City before it moved to Fairfield, Connecticut. Uh, and Jack resisted. He liked being in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where he was sort of a, a big fish in a small pond. And, you know, he could rule the roost without any interference from corporate until, uh, you know, finally uh, he was told by Reg Jones that if he, you know, he, he, his career would uh, be stunted if, you know, he didn't uh, move from Pittsfield to to New York or, or, or Fairfield. So he ultimately uh, moved to Fairfield uh, at about the same time that GE moved his headquarters out of New York City. Yeah, he had an incredible uh, personal touch with people and also he always played to win, whether it's golf or in the business. I mean, he was an incredibly uh, competitive uh, person. He was an only child and uh, you know, to, to, you know, from a Catholic family, you know, they thought they were going to have lots of kids, but they only had Jack. Uh, he was an athlete uh, growing up, even though he was not a big guy, he was a little guy. Uh, but, you know, his mother sort of instilled in him this incredible sense of confidence. He also, you know, had a stutter, which his uh, mother, one, you know, helped him overcome. His mother was a very important driving force in his life. His father was a you know, an engineer on the uh, railroad that went from Boston to the North Shore of Massachusetts, uh, uh, more sort of absent uh, father. Uh, his mother was much more important to him. But, uh, you know, he's always extremely competitive and always wanted to, you know, get the highest bonus, get promoted faster. Uh, and when he discovered after his first year at GE that, you know, everybody sort of in his little group got the same bonus he he quit because uh he was pissed off that uh he didn't he didn't think everybody uh deserved the same bonus because he thought that his performance was better than uh his competitors his colleagues and he should be rewarded uh uh and he had actually taken another job at a company in the Chicago area and um Basically, one of his uh, rabbis uh, at GE, so to speak, you know, talked him out of leaving. They even had a goodbye party for him with like goodbye gifts. He went through with having the goodbye party and kept the gifts, but then stayed at GE uh, anyway and uh, ended up, uh, you know, becoming a superstar uh, in short order and, and, you know, no longer had to report to the guy who had treated him like uh, his peers uh, and, and gravitated towards the guy who recognized that he was, uh, you know, exceptional in many ways. So he was noted, he was selected, and he was given a chance to run this hugely successful company. Uh, did he have any strategic goals or did he have any kind of... Uh, strategy in place or philosophy in place that where G should be, what G should be, uh, because he had incredible uh, outlook also for the future. He was always experimenting with new technologies and new ways of doing things. And maybe can you give us a little bit of color on it? He was a definitely a change agent. Uh, he, he was the youngest uh, uh, candidate uh, among uh the five who were competing to succeed Reg uh, Jones. Uh, you know, he had made plastics very successful. He ran GE Capital and, and grew it and others of GE's businesses that were under his purview. Uh, but he uh, was determined to change GE. 
Uh, he, he thought it had gotten too bloated and bureaucratic. So at first he was referred to as Neutron Jack because he, uh, you know, eliminated uh, tens of thousands of employees and left the building standing like a neutron bomb. And um, he was also determined to uh, make GE, you know, if, if GE weren't uh, one, number one or number two in a particular business line, uh, then uh, he wanted to, uh, you know, sell that business. Uh, and he, you know, he only, he bought businesses uh, that would bolster GE's uh, ability to be number one or number two in, uh, in an industry. And, you know, he also was fortunate and he became CEO at a time when uh, after the stock market for many years had done nothing, it, it basically took off and he sort of rode, rode that wave. So a lot of things uh, uh, came together, could have been viewed as, as, as luck. But I think, you know, he, he had a, a real vision for what GE uh, needed to be and needed to become and how it needed to change. And uh, it started with firing tens of thousands of people, getting out of uh, the commodity business, Utah International, uh, which he sold, which had been a, a big company that uh, Reg Jones had bought it that time was the largest M&A deal ever. Uh, he then uh, bought RCA, effectively buying back RCA with GE. I discovered that GE had started after World War One at the uh, request of Woodrow Wilson uh, and then was forced to divest it in the early 1930s by the Justice Department because of concerns about antitrust. And so in 1986, Jack bought it back, which brought him, uh, brought GE uh, NBC, which of course, uh, you know, Jack loved. So, you know, and then he started uh, CNBC and MSNBC and a lot of the things that we take for granted now, of course, GE doesn't own it anymore. But um, Jack uh, definitely had a vision. You know, he made mistakes after successfully buying RCA, which people uh, hailed as one of the best m a deals of all time he turned around the next year in 1987 and bought kidder peabody thinking you know that he was kind of like invincible and that was obviously a huge mistake right from the beginning but um interestingly they spent like uh you know 600 million dollars buying it and then had to put hundreds of millions of more dollars uh of capital into it and you know eventually um there was insider trading, there was scandals. Uh, it was really a total disaster. Um, you know, and I was working at G Capital at the time that they bought Kidder. And it was, you know, the idea of sort of integrating Kidder with G Capital was a, was a disaster. Uh, but in the end, he sold uh, parts of Kidder to uh, Payne Weber, which sort of uh, got him out of the business. And then when Payne Weber was sold to uh, Union Bank of you know, UBS, uh, you know, GE and Jack made out like bandits. Uh, so in the end, even though it was um, not a good deal and a very stupid deal, um, uh, Jack seemed to make a uh, financial success of it. In fact, uh, there wasn't even due diligence at that time when they acquired Kidder Peabody. They didn't know how many customers they had. Nothing. Yeah, it was a it was a big. Jack just got sort of swept up into this idea that, you know, GE could own an investment bank. You know, people. You know, a lot of there were a lot of companies, you know, buying Sears. Uh, you know, owned Dean Witter. I mean, there were the American Express was buying. Uh, you know, investment banks. You know, th these things sort of go in these waves, these crazy waves of fashion and jack totally got caught up in it and uh but i think he realized uh, relatively quickly it was a mistake uh that there was, there was certainly not a cultural fit and then uh there was uh you know any number of you know of scandals uh with marty siegel and uh joe jett and others and uh uh probably people don't even uh remember that uh so much anymore but uh it was it was a big blunder, and you know I think Jack uh, at least was man enough to admit it. But uh, you bring up three very important issues surrounding this deal at the time. One, Walter Ruston, who was former CEO of uh, Citibank, advised him not to buy Kidder Peabody. Uh, second, 
despite the debacle of Kilipi Body, he, nothing really happened to him, and that's why he got the name Teflon Jack. And the third thing that was also very important at the time was that uh, GE Capital was already well established, and uh, he was looking more and more at, as a future earnings growth driver to GE Capital. All that happened at the same time. Well, I mean, Jack loved G Capital. You know, he told me it was a lot easier to make money from money than it was uh, making money from, you know, bending, bending steel. And, you know, he, he really, I mean, he had been head of G Capital before he was named CEO. And I think he uh, really sort of loved uh, arbitraging GE's AAA credit rating. Uh, they could borrow money very, very cheaply. Uh, and then uh, uh, lend it out uh, at much higher rates. So a way to gush profits, uh, immensely profitable. It, uh, it, you know, by the end, it was sort of like 50% of GE's profits uh, came from GE Capital. And it also gave him a tremendous uh, amount of flexibility. You know, if it looked like the industrial side of the business wasn't going to deliver the earnings that he wanted, he could sell uh, some of the GE Capital assets. Uh, whether it was loans or equity positions or real estate or, you know, whatever it happened to be, portfolio of, of assets and uh, make up that difference. Now, and a lot of people then accused Jack of manipulating earnings because he was doing that. But, you know, I, I don't really look at it that way. I think, you know, he was CEO of GE, which was made up of two parts, an industrial company and a financial services company. And uh, to me, it would have been irresponsible to uh, promise uh, research analysts you were going to make X amount of earnings and then miss what you told people you were going to make uh, because you didn't want to, you know, sort of harvest some of the assets that existed over G Capital. So um, I know people accuse Jack of uh, this sort of manipulation, but I, I don't have a problem uh, with what he did. I think he knew the kind of company he was running. Uh, he managed it well. You know, he I think he was aware of the risks that existed uh, in a financial services company and the kind of risks that uh, existed in borrowing short and lending long. And I think he managed that, those risks, uh, unlike, say, Jeff Immelt, his successor, who did not, I think, understand the risks inherent at GE Capital nearly like Jack did. Uh, was there any cultural expense in the sense that I, I get a sense when I read the book that there was uh, some kind of a fear that kind of pervaded throughout the organization. And the second thing was that uh, he was very focused on, on his this theme of delivering consistent earnings. And once you have an earning number that you set, the whole organization must bend backwards to deliver that number. Any thoughts on that or any discussion? Well, again, he was a very competitive guy. Uh, he liked to win. He liked, you know, if he promised, uh, you know, he, he loved, you know, he had the Wall Street research analysts eating out of the palm of his hands. He had the media eating out of the bottom of his hands. Uh, you know, he had loved going on CNBC. Uh, you know, he started MSNBC. You know, if he said GE was going to make a certain amount of earnings, he was damned if he wasn't going to make those earnings. And, you know, he would, uh, he had a bunch of arrows in the quiver and he wasn't afraid to use them. So, you know, it was a, a competitive culture. It was a lot of uh, uh, talented people there, without question, who've, you know, left there and, and gone on to, you know, lead, be CEOs of companies all across the world. You know, it is it, sort of very different kind of talent than I saw, you know, during the rest of my Wall Street career working at investment banks. But that that didn't mean that there weren't many, many talented people there who uh, uh, Jack encouraged, uh, uh, often found that um, he could get more out of them than they thought that uh, they had in them themselves. So, you know, it turns out, you know, you, you know, when he when he bought when he took over the company, it was had a market a value of 12 billion, you know, when he left or, or near right, you know, sort of right before he left, it was worth $650 billion. It was the most valuable company in the world. It was 
the most respected company in the world. People had left there and gone on to uh, do other uh, important jobs. You know, what more can you ask for, really? He uh, wasn't a flawless uh, person by any stretch of the imagination. He had a lot of faults. He probably would get canceled in today's environment, but, you know, he, he was CEO at a very different time and he really made GE into something special. Exactly. I mean, you brought up a very good example in the book of, uh, uh, that kind of is a testament to the power of uh, Jack Welch and his stature and uh, what happened to Thomas O. Boyle. Well, that was, again, one of the uglier uh, uh, chapters in uh, GE's uh, history and Jack's history. Uh, basically, uh, Thomas F. O. Boyle was a uh, journalist at the Wall Street Journal who covered GE for long stretches of time and then decided he wanted to write a book about GE and he he wrote a book proposal and it was uh you know accepted by a publisher and somehow GE and Jack got a hold of the book proposal not even the book just the book proposal and then uh Jack uh you know sicked Dan Webb who was a former US attorney in Chicago and still still a very powerful uh, attorney in, at Winston & Strawn in Chicago and um, to this day, and uh, basically sicked Dan Webb on Thomas F. O. Boyle uh, in an endless stream of letters, threatening letters, basically uh, threatening him with being uh, prosecuted or, or sued if, uh, you know, he wrote this book, you know, just based on getting his uh, book proposal, which contained uh, things that Jack uh, didn't like. Uh, and, you know, it took him, you know, five or six or seven years to write this book uh, and being harassed by Jack and Dan Webb the whole way. The book finally gets published. And, you know, I would say GE did everything it, in its power it could to kill the book. In the end, the experience was so traumatic for Thomas F. O. Boyle. And obviously, I've a lot of empathy for him as a writer myself, that Thomas F. O. Boyle gave up journalism and literally found religion, became, you know, a serious devotee of uh, his uh, local church. So there you go. Not pretty. Not pretty. Moving on, uh, Jack had a pretty severe heart attack uh, because, you know, he didn't really have an office. He was always moving, always traveling, always going around the world, uh, but the stress eventually got to him. Yeah, he had uh, heart bypass surgery and then um, more heart bypass surgery. Yeah, he, he did. He, he had heart surgery, but basically uh, that uh, was very successful. And he had other uh, ailments, though. He almost died of a like a staph infection. He was in the hospital for several months, and um, you know, obviously, he passed away in uh, March of 2020, just before the pandemic. But it wasn't from heart uh, issues, uh, or so they say. So, you know, his mother died of a heart attack. Uh, uh, his father, I think, died of a heart attack. So he was, you know sort of a little bit of a marked man uh, from that perspective. But uh, I think they basically uh, put his heart in good shape again. So, you know, he died of other things. Uh, Jack Welch decided to resign, or uh, was that a little bit earlier than he thought, or just uh, that's, that, that was the right time for him to leave? Actually, he uh, stayed a, a year longer than, or almost a year longer than he thought he was going to stay. Uh, he uh, was supposed to, uh, you know, he, he, he was supposed to retire after 20 years, uh, which is a very long time for a CEO. Uh, but that was sort of what, uh, you know, he was young when he became the CEO, and that was what they wanted. Um, so he sort of retired, I was going to retire after 20 years, uh, but uh, uh, and in 2000. Instead, uh, right as he was sort of getting ready to retire, um, United Technologies, which is another conglomerate uh, uh, based in and around Hartford, made an agreement to buy Honeywell. And uh, Jack 
uh, had studied Honeywell. I mean, Jack was basically an M and A machine, and um, they'd studied Honeywell earlier uh, in that year in 2000. Decided that its uh, price was too high, stock price was too high. The stock price had come down, and then uh, United Technology makes this bid, and Jack decided that uh, he had to uh, beat. United couldn't let United Technologies get Honeywell, had to beat United Technologies for uh, the company and essentially made a bid topping uh, United Technologies bid that Honeywell eventually uh, accepted. Uh, And uh, Jack agreed to extend his tenure at GE by about a year to uh, make sure that the deal closed and you know that it was properly integrated so that his successor Jeff Immold wouldn't have to you know have that burden to do that uh so uh the board agreed to extend his being CEO for another year but in the end you know the EU you know the US uh uh approved uh, the transaction but the EU the European Union uh sought to block the transaction and uh Jack had to end up going uh, over uh, and try to fight with the EU to get them to approve the deal. And then ultimately, Jack uh, did not uh, like uh, where things were ending up with the EU. And as he told me, you know, he thought he was buying an 18 hole golf course, but he only got 15 holes. So he didn't want to buy an 18 hole golf course and only get 15 holes. So he decided to walk away from the Honeywell deal. Uh, and then soon thereafter retired. In fact, uh, uh, Jeff Immel took over uh, as CEO of uh, GE four days before 9-11. Hmm. And his we... first day in the office was 9-11. Yeah, very sad. Or, or, or second, second day, I guess. Second day, yeah. yeah. Among many successes Jack Welch had, uh, one of the major successes was uh, how rapidly GE Capital had expanded. But as you bring it up very nicely and explain in a very detailed fashion in the book, it was all based on the short-term borrowing and lending for the long term, which is obviously not viable in the long term. He should have known that. He would have known that, but he he was not concerned about it. Look, I think Jack uh, understood uh, G Capital uh, well, but I, I think and understood the risks of G Capital well. I think... Um, this idea of uh, borrowing short and lending long and the risks uh, inherent in that is something that um, most people uh, can't get their mind around until uh, they actually see it in action. Uh, you know, I wrote a book about the collapse of Bear Stearns called House of Cards, uh, which came out in uh, 2009. And, you know, that the, the same thing that you know, got uh, Bear Stearns uh, into trouble is what got G Capital into trouble. And, you know, no one at Bear Stearns uh, had any clue that that was even possible, that they could, uh, their short-term lenders could pull the plug on them. Uh, You know, I don't, uh, you know, whether Jack understood that or not, uh, I don't know. Jeff Immelt, I mean, because he wasn't running the place in 2008, uh, Jeff Immelt certainly did not understand uh, Uh, the dangers of of that. And uh, by the time he did uh, figure it out, he had to go, you know, hat in hand to Hank Paulson and Sheila Baer at the FDIC to, uh, you know, to essentially bail out G Capital uh, because G Capital was not a bank. They were not uh, bailed out in the same way. They were not part of the TARP. They were not bailed out in the same way uh, that uh, the rest of Wall Street was. So, uh, you know, he had to sort of go hat in hand to Paulson and uh, Sheila Bear to get access to the lines of capital that the Treasury and the Fed made available to financial institutions uh, after uh, September 15th, 2008, uh, or else uh, G Capital was going to file for bankruptcy. I mean, it was pretty dire. And uh, Jeff, Jeff Emmel did a good job of you know, sort of begging uh, for help, uh, but he, he did not particularly do a good job of listening to, uh, you know, warnings that uh, he was receiving from people left and right, you know, in the years leading up to that. 
including his treasurer. Including his treasurer, including his head of head of real estate at GE Capital, uh, including including Wall Street uh, uh, research analysts, including rating agencies, uh, including Jim Grant at Grant's Interest Rate Observer, who kept writing over and over and over again <laughs> about the risks, uh, including you know a hedge fund manager who uh, you know got shut up. Uh, because, uh, you know, they didn't want to hear this. So uh, there were a lot of warnings, and um, Jeff didn't want to hear it. There was a one fascinating, very small detail you had in the book, which really surprised me. Uh, rating agencies, obviously the two leading agencies, S&P and Moody's, had concern about this thing, but Jack never wanted to see them. I believe he never met them. He didn't really care about that really left that, that really allowed GE Capital to become what it was, but he didn't really want to meet a rating company. Well, Jeff didn't want to meet with the rating agencies. Uh, he did reluctantly. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, I think during Jack's tenure, you know, GE was rated AAA uh, and there was no threat of a downgrade. So. I mean, you know, you have to understand that, you know, recall that the world changed dramatically uh, after 9-11, obviously. Uh, and then, you know, with the, you know, there was all those scandals, WorldCom, Enron, uh, Enron uh, Global Crossing, Adelphia, that resulted in the uh, passage of the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, law. And, uh, you know, the world changed. and um, GE uh, and GE Capital uh, kept on taking more and more debt on, uh, and the, you know the red flags were being raised by the rating agencies and Treasurer and Jim Grant and others. Uh, uh, Bill Gross uh, got very concerned, uh, uh, the bond king, uh, and uh, basically Jeff ignored. You also brought up a very important issue, what really meant to Jeff and GE to be declared as CFE, a systematically important financial institution, which almost cost them $2 billion and 5,000 people working there, and also government attending the board meetings. Jeff didn't like that. Yeah, so after uh, after Jack, after Jeff uh, had to uh, beg uh, Hank Paulson and Sheila Bear, uh to essentially be rescued financially, the price of that being admitted into that particular club was uh, that that GE became G Capital became a SIFI, a systemically important financial institution, which meant that they were uh, regulated by the Fed, like uh, you know Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase and Morgan Stanley. And uh, Jeff Immel did not like that. As you said, he thought it uh, added some sort of $2 billion worth of cost to uh, GE's uh, cost structure and more, much, way too much oversight for Jeff's taste. And, you know, it was one thing to sort of uh, tell them what they could do with GE Capital, but he was very concerned that Fed might start telling them what they could do at, uh, at GE and the industrial company. Uh, and so he was determined to get G Capital uh, to be no longer be a SIFI as quickly as he could. Uh, and that was uh, dismantling of G Capital uh, until uh, he created something called Project Hubble uh, in and around 2015, which was his decision to sell, to announce that they were going to sell G Capital, which, of course, uh, put them in a, a must sell position and let, you know, sort of the world pick their pocket. Then the next thing you knew, they were uh, out of uh, G Capital, which I think was a major mistake. And uh, I mean, there's the, one of the best performing industries uh, since the 2008 financial crisis uh, was financial services. Uh, G Capital had been one of the biggest players worldwide in financial services and then suddenly was out of it. And so uh, they had no way to replace uh, the earnings. Uh, that were lost and, uh, you know, it just became a downward spiral of disappointing investors and, and Wall Street research analysts. Uh, 
And of course, uh, you know, Jeff decided he would uh, bring in Nelson Peltz at Tryon Partners, uh, the activist hedge fund manager, to get them to invest. They invested two and a half billion dollars in GE, uh, thinking that it would sort of ratify his uh, brilliance of, uh, uh, you know, getting out of GE Capital. And Jeff Immelt had uh, gone to uh, Dartmouth with Nelson Peltz's son-in-law's brother and thought that somehow that familial uh, relationship would inoculate uh, him from uh, getting, uh, you know, feeling the full wrath of an activist investor. Uh, But he found out that actually it, it didn't. And it cost him his job. A lot of money was lost, and uh, you know, essentially, it led to the uh, where we are now, which is the breakup of the company. Yeah, I mean, Jeff's uh, tenure was marked by two very important deals that you brought up. One was he sold NBC Universal cheaper than it should have been, and he bought Alstom, which is based in France, uh, at a higher price than it should have been, and both had consequences. Yes, uh, Jeff, you know, decided that, you know, after the 2008 financial crisis that GE needed more capital, that GE Capital needed more capital, and that the best way to get capital would be to sell something that would be easy to sell. So uh, he uh, decided to sell what was then called NBC Universal. And he didn't conduct an auction. He just called up uh, Brian Roberts at Comcast and said, you know, are you interested, you know, uh, uh, in buying this? And, of course, he knew that he was because Brian had uh, had had shared his interest many times over the years. And, uh, you know, instead of running an auction to try to get the highest price, he basically just sold it in two pieces to Comcast, uh, I think, you know, for around $30 billion. You know, before the pandemic, I think it's safe to say... Uh, NBC Universal was worth closer to $100 billion. So that probably wasn't the greatest decision uh, that Jeff made. And then to, to replace uh, the earnings that were going to be lost from the sale of G Capital and the sale of NBC Universal, Jack, uh, Jeff decided to double down on GE's uh, uh, power uh, systems business by buying Alstom in France and uh, I think way overpaying. So the double whammy of uh, probably selling or triple whammy of selling NBC Universal too low, getting out of G Capital probably at too low a price, uh, paying too much for Alstom, and you know then taking some of the proceeds of the sale of G Capital and buying back G stock at a, at a high uh, price. You know, as, as, as Dave Calhoun, who was a all-star GE executive for, for a while and now is the CEO of Boeing, uh, told me, uh, and I, I think it basically sums things up pretty well. And that is that, you know, every time Jack Welch had a big decision to make, he made the right decision. And every time that Jeff Immelt had a big decision to make, he made the wrong decision. And it's a little harsh, but, um, but it sounds I think it's well. accurate. Yeah. I think it's accurate. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you also brought up the whole issue around success theater. But I think all of these things that you provide a very good context in the book is they were all driven by one overarching pressure of managing earnings or creating earnings to please stockholders at any cost. Do you think that was driving force behind all these things or that was not the case? Well, I think um, a CEO is always has to, of a public company and always has to worry about generating earnings to satisfy shareholders uh, and on a quarterly basis. I think that's sort of one of the problems with being a public company is you do have to do that. And when you're you know, like one of the leading public companies, one of the bellwether public companies uh, like GE, um, then, you know, there's going to be all the more pressure. If you're if you're if you're a company that nobody really cares about, uh, then you know maybe you know you miss here and there, no big no big deal. But you know, people GE was a bellwether. It was in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It was one of the few AAA rated companies. You know what what GE did mattered, and so I'm sure there was a lot of pressure on Jack, just like there was a lot of pressure on Jeff to uh, 
to generate earnings. And when you get rid of you know, 50% of your earnings by winding down GE Capital and you use some of the proceeds of that to buy back stock at a high price and then the stock goes down. And when you try to replace those earnings by doing an overpriced deal for an industry that's kind of like fell off the cliff as soon as you closed the deal, which happened in the power industry, the <laughs> Then, and, then, and then you don't, uh, you know, then you stick to this idea, you know, you'll remember from reading the book that he stuck to this idea of making $2 a share in earnings in 2018 uh, when, you know, basically no, no Wall Street analysts believed that he could do that. And many of his own uh, people, uh, you know, executives didn't believe he could do it, but he refused to bend on that. And then, of course, when he missed you know, it eventually cost him his job. And then they missed that by, uh, they made, you know, a dollar a share instead of $2 a share when they missed by a country mile. I mean, and Jeff would never acknowledge that as a possibility. So, you know, he was, you know, hubristic, you know, he could have reset uh, expectations after 9-11, which everyone would have, would have understood. You know, he was a different company. It was a different time. He, he didn't, you know, he was going to pursue a different strategic agenda than Jack had, but he, did, he didn't do that. He didn't really reset after 2008. He didn't really reset 10 years later. I think Jeff uh, is, uh, you know, perfectly nice guy. You, you, you meet him, you can't help but be impressed by him. But he, uh, he was probably like, uh, you know, too optimistic, eternal optimism, you know, which is probably what he felt like, uh, you know, a CEO of GE should be. You know, I don't think he was uh, realistic. And that all came back to bite him. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, after he left, uh, there was a $22 billion write-off uh, because of the uh, long-term insurance that they kept owning even after selling Genworth. Uh, also uh, caused a lot of turbulence. And I think the real issue uh, that I was surprised, and in fact, uh, Jeff mentioned the uh, smiling crocodile, knowing the reputation of Trian and Nelson Peltz, inviting him uh, f- for owning less than 1% of the company, but pretty much controlling the company and putting a man on the board who had eventually fired him and took his job, Larry Culp. Uh, well, uh, Jeff had gotten fired by Ed Garden, you know, Nelson Peltz's son-in-law. Um, Sorry, yes. Uh, yes. They, they weren't on the, he wasn't on the board then, but time, basically, right. you know, pu- pulled the plug on Jeff in the summer of, of 2017. Uh, John Flannery was appointed. Uh, and then, uh, Ed Garden did go on the board. Uh, Larry Culp went on the board and essentially the fox was in the head of house. And, uh, October of 2018, uh, there was a coup, uh, engineered by Ed Garden and, uh, Larry Culp to get John Flannery fired, even though he was really, you know, he had a 15 month tenure, even though he was trying to put out all the fires that, uh, Jeff Immelt had left him, including this, uh, liability at long term, uh, the long term healthcare business that Jeff Immelt could have sent off with Genworth Financial when he got rid of the other insurance businesses, but didn't do that. That was a big mistake. And you no know, problems in the power business that Jeff Immelt had left him. And John Flannery took the first blow. And then, uh, you know, even though it wasn't his fault, uh, un- under his tenure, the GE stock went from, you know, like 25 bucks to 10 bucks as he had to sort of deal with each of these revelations that had been built up during Jeff Immelt's tenure. And then uh, they decapitated him and brought in Larry Culp. Uh, and Larry Culp is still there, and he's essentially uh, executing on the uh, business plan that John Flannery uh, had outlined during his tenure. But it's Larry Culp getting all the credit for it instead of John Flannery. Yeah, and while shareholders are suffering, Culp is prospering with his uh, pretty impressive uh, contract. Yes, uh, very impressive contract. He's the first GE CEO to have a contract, and he gets paid uh, like $21 million a year contractually. And then there were these, uh, he got a big stock grant, certain Stock prices were achieved, and none of those were achieved. Uh, and then in August 2020, during the pandemic, when GE stock was at one of its low points, 
like trading at around six dollars a share. The board recuts Larry Culp's uh, target uh, goals, and uh, you know, lo and behold, uh, now he's achieved them all, and he gets like a seven million dollar bonus. Even though, uh, yes, the G stock is now up from when he took over, but it's still below those original price targets that. He was supposed to achieve to get the bonus, but they recut that uh, back in August 2020. And uh, now he's going to get, uh, if he stays, I think, uh, as CEO uh, through next month, he'll get the $237 million uh, of stock. Fascinating. And this is the uh, uh, aggressive shareholder, Crayon, who really is trying to create shareholder value, but it looks like the value is only created for cult. Yeah, I think um, the stock is probably up 40% in the last five years, which uh, since he took over nearly five years, uh, which is, you know, not bad. Obviously, at various times it was it was down, but uh, lately, you know, executing on John Flannery's uh, idea for splitting the company up into three companies, which uh, Culp is in the process of executing, uh, the stock is up about 40%. Again, uh, uh, the original price targets for him to get the bonus was that the stock had to go up 50%. So it hasn't even done that. But when you recut recut the price targets to uh, low uh, numbers that are easily achievable, you know, no surprise. Uh, I, it's hard to figure out whether Tryon has made money on GE, I think. They sold about half of it, their stake in a profit, and I'm not even sure uh, how much of it they still own uh, or whether uh, they are, you know, have uh, now made money or not. Uh, it certainly was one of their bigger investments, and I don't think it, you know, it, it, uh, from an IRR point of view, a time value of money point of view, has not done well for them, no. Mm -hmm. Switching the subject a little bit here, uh, how did you end up? writing this book why did you get interested in me you've done very well with the goldman sachs book and also a book on bear stearns how did ge caught your attention well my my first job uh, out of business school was at ge capital in uh, 1987 i was uh, financing leverage buyouts of all things and my office mate at that time was john flannery a guy who went on to become the ceo of ge and uh you know after he became the ceo of ge you know we were all uh, very excited for him because he had uh you know was a great guy and had been had, had achieved this rather incredible goal and success but uh pretty, pretty quickly after he got the job he would and we've remained friends. And so he would tell me some of the crazy things that were going on there. And then at one point, you know, suggested I write a book about it. And I said, John, I can't uh, do that because you're the CEO and you're my friend. So I can't do that. But when he got fired 15 months later, uh, I decided, you know what, I, uh, there's something here that I got to explore. So that's when that's when I did it. What was the most uh, surprising thing for you? Because you have an investment banking experience. You have seen a lot. You are an excellent writer. You have done a lot of thinking over the years. What kind of caught your eye that you would have never expected or surprised you? Well, I mean, I think the whole story of, uh, of it, you know, of, of its rise and fall, I mean, uh, nobody would have anticipated that, you know, the world's most valuable and most respected company uh, would, uh, and most important company. I mean, it's like, you know, what if Apple suddenly disappeared? I think books would be written about that. And, uh, well, I mean, if Kodak were as an important company as GE or Apple, yeah, I mean, people still probably wrote books about Kodak or or Polaroid or what, you know, I mean, companies go in and out of business all the time. I mean, but, it, it, you know, it was kind of unthinkable when Jack Welch uh, left GE that it would, you know, become irrelevant or, you know, it hasn't gone out of business, obviously, but it's not near, it's not anything like what it used to be. And, um, you know, I thought that, you know, that is a story uh, worth, worth telling. So that's why I, uh, uh, got interested in it and uh you know it's just a real cautionary tale and you know it's you know it's uh an incredibly important uh american company global company and you know the personalities were great uh you know uh, what happened was fascinating and i decided you know it was it was a lot to bite off because uh you know it, it was founded in 1892 and had a, a long history uh you know 
uh, that was fairly well documented along the way. You know, I wrote my first book about Lazard, where I worked, and that was founded in 1848. But until, you know, after World War II, like literally 100 years later, there really wasn't much going on at Lazard. You know, it wasn't really much of of anything. And um, so anyway, it was uh, uh, it was quite a challenge to write this book. I urge everyone to go and get the book and read it. It is there are a lot of valuable insights that you can gain, uh, whether you're an academic or you are a management expert or you are a CEO of a company. You can learn a lot. What was your view about the uh, board? But the board, I think you said it very well. The board always allowed Jack to do whatever he wants to do, but he, he did always the right thing. And they did the same thing with Jeff, and Jeff always did the wrong thing. But board never responded to your questions. Uh, they never want to take any responsibility for it. Does really board matter? Yes, the board is supposed to matter. They're supposed to represent the shareholders. Uh, exactly. Uh, but I would say in this case, they pretty much abdicated. Uh, they sort of did what uh, the CEOs wanted them to do. And very few of them took responsibility for what they uh, had done uh, and avoided me at all costs. Not all of them. Uh, Ken Langone spoke to me, and that was very helpful and brilliant. Had, had a little input here and there from Sandy Warner, the former CEO of J.P. Morgan. But most ran as quickly as they could in the other direction from me, did not want to take any responsibility for what had, had gone on there. And, you know, I, I think, you know, like, you know, Jack Brennan, for instance, the former CEO of Vanguard, you know, who's the lead director, who was the lead director, lead independent director uh, in Vanguard, of course, being, you know, one of the premier you know, money management firms should be, you know, highly focused on shareholder value and shareholder rights and doing things for the shareholders. He never would talk to me, never would engage with me. I tried 10 different ways to try to speak to him and um, he wouldn't he wouldn't do it and ended up sort of taking off of his LinkedIn uh, profile the fact that he'd even been the lead independent director of GE. So, I mean, you can't you can't make this uh, stuff up. I mean, just their unwillingness to uh, take responsibility for their actions is uh, cowardly and pathetic, if you ask me. It is. It is. Well, I want to thank you for your comments and writing the book. I think you were very uh, comprehensive and complete. Thank you. Thank you.